I start by again welcoming, uh, first of all, uh, the, all the participants and the panelists who have agreed to participate in this webinar. It is a, a great pleasure for us as a, uh, as a panelist to participate and contribute our knowledge to other people and also to learn from other participants more about this emerging, uh, emerging legal practice in, about on insolvency. As I would say, insolvency legal practice is not a novel practice as per se, but it is a, a legal practice that has been developing and with uh, so much innovation as the world economy, economic trends also trended. Uh, but recently, in about three years ago, where the world was hit by the pandemic of COVID-19. And in this, in this, the effects of this pandemic were, were and are still very disastrous and have affected many businesses and individuals, not only. But much as this, this uh, big type of legal uh, regime tends to be dominated by businesses, but also you agree with me that also individuals have become bankrupt. Maybe they have not been declared by the court, but really they have been affected. So different personal, different entities, natural and illegal, have all been affected by the pandemic. So now the question, the question here by which this webinar is trying to, to discuss is majorly what, what has been the effect economic effect, social effect by, by this pandemic in within our region. We are limiting ourselves in the region of East Africa. But still, maybe we may not be able to grasp the whole phenomenon until we understand the, the legal terminologies of bankrupts and insolvents and how they differ in, in practice. And in this webinar, Mr. Ive Sangano from Rwanda, who is, who is our, 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 who will be our first speaker, will introduce himself and he will talk about, he will tell us what he's going to talk about. And then from there, um, Others will also introduce themselves. I don't want to choose each panelist here because I mean I don't want to make a mistake about your profile. So uh, clever, you are welcome. I can see clever Negara. Good morning. Brundi. Sorry for being late. I had uh, technical problems. No worries, no worries. Thank God you have you have come. So I will begin by by introducing myself, and then it will be followed by if then Tabita. Are you taking a note? Tabita will follow. Then Fred will follow. Victoria will follow. And Clever will follow. Fatima is joining. So as Fatima joins, I can start. My name, my name is Isaac Abizumuremi. I'm a legal practitioner from Rwanda, practicing at the law firm called Rex Chambers. And uh, I'm honored to be the chairperson of the Insolvency Committee at ARS. I'll be your moderator this afternoon in this webinar, and I will come everyone to this webinar. More particularly, um, we are glad that uh, we have many participants in the room. You are most welcome. We will have only, we limit this 
the, our presentation for only one hour. And thereafter, we, the other hour will be for, for, for the participants in the room to ask questions, it will be Q&A session. Uh, Mr. Eve, can you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ellis, for organizing this uh, important session. Uh, my name is Yves Sangano. I'm the chief associate as Case Solution and Partners. Um, it's a law firm operating here in Rwanda. Uh, I'm also a part-time lecturer at, at the Institute of Legal Practice and Development, ELPD. And the past I used to be the deputy registration of companies. Uh, this way I do have um, a lot of experience to share with you uh, in terms of uh, insolvency proceedings here in Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Tabita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Tabitha Mwaneki. I work uh, for Parastato, known as uh, Kenya National Assurance 2001 Limited. Um, I'm happy to be part of this uh, conversation of insolvency. Uh, previously, I worked for the Office of the Official Receiver. So I have quite some bit of interest in this uh, particular topic. Thank you, Tabitha. Victoria. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria Nasuna. I'm a managing partner with Heritage Associated Advocates. Um, I'm an insolvency practitioner in Uganda, and I'm um, excited to be part of, of this committee and, and I'm ready to serve. And I'm also part of this conversation, which I'm looking forward to. Yes. Thank you, Victoria. Fred? Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fred Ringo. I am the partner in the law firm of ARS Law and Advisories in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I have uh, quite a number of years experience under my belt and uh, uh, I would be very happy to discuss issues of insolvency which I've handled for more than 25 years. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Fred Ringo. Uh, Greva, are you there? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greva Nigarura. I'm a senior partner at uh, Lube and Co Advocate. Uh, this is a, a dear Piper uh, Africa uh, firm based in Burundi. I'll be happy uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Clever. Uh, Vice Chair, do you want do you want also to bless us with your with your presence here, Vice Chair for Insolvency Committee, Fatima? Uh, Isaac, uh, thank you so much uh, for welcoming me. Uh, I'm Fadma Songoro, and I'm serving as the vice uh, chair for the Insolvency Committee. I'm so glad uh, that we're having this conversation, and I believe uh, it will be one of the most meaningful conversation in this area of practice, and look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, vice chair. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, let's this time give an opportunity to Mr. Ivi Sangano. Ivi Sangano, as he said, has presented his uh, his brief. He was a former uh, before he joined the bar. He was uh, 
He was the deputy insolvency chief insolvency um, administrator in the office of Registrar General. Eva Sangana has got enormous experience. He participated in the drafting and reviewing a number of insolvency laws we have had in Rwanda. And in this webinar, he's going to tell us the distinction between bankruptcy and insolvency within the modern context. But he will not be limited to, to, to share any distinction he knows uh, in, the, in, in other jurisdictions and how the, the two concepts differ. Eva will also give us, share with us the protections, uh, the data's protection that, that uh, under the Rwandan insolvency law and uh, how courts have, have applied uh, in, their, in, their, in their judicial determinations, how they have applied these protections. So basically, he will tell us in this discussion, you tell us how those uh, various options that are available for a data to have a, a breathing space when he's financially distressed and is being is being um, hunted by the creditors. Mr. Eve, your time, please. Remember, you have we have eaten our time. That's not too much because you have ten minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. And so, Isaac, um, I'll try to be quick as much as possible so that other panelists would, would have their time, enough time to uh, to make presentation. Um, uh, the Rwanda law has been um, uh, changed a lot. As you may know, um, Rwanda use what you can call a combined system where we do have some aspect of the common law system and uh, others mainly uh, for the civil uh, law system. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a combination of the two uh, systems that um, uh, the Rwanda law has adopted, uh, whereby um, the best practice for each uh, system has been borrowed and uh, incorporated into our laws. Um, normally, as you, we know, the, the main purpose of having the insolvency law, insolvency system in a country, uh, first is to promote entrepreneurship, uh, to make sure that uh, loans or credits are available to investors and make sure that the interest of the uh, all, uh, stakeholders, including uh, different type of creditors, are taken, in, uh, are taken into consideration when it comes to resolve issues arising uh, from insolvency. Uh, then it will help also to reduce time for resolving um, uh, insolvency issues and maximize the value of the assets so that um, all the creditors um, can get uh, their uh, their credit back as much as, as possible. Um, as you know, uh, why um, this, this law? Uh, we know that um, the business life cycle, uh, which means uh, each business goes through different phases. Uh, there is establishment, establishment when, where the business entered in, in the market there is a, a period of growth, there is a maturity phase, and also there is a post-maturity phase. Um, uh, in all those different phases, uh, a business can fail or uh, can go, go into insolvency. Uh, the insolvency law has be, is there, especially here in Rwanda. Uh, the way uh, the solvency law is designed is designed in the way that it gives um, options for um, a business person or a company uh, before they may start a proper insolvency proceedings 
uh, there is a process that we that is provided for under, uh, under the law that they can use uh, so that they can deal uh, with some of the creditors uh, in order to find a solution of their distressed situation. Um, this is why uh, the service law is there for easy doing business uh, because on the market, um, you we have to make sure that there is a free entry, uh, there is freedom, uh, free competition, and free exit. Uh, at, at that discontinuation of the business, the free exit, uh, where we are going to focus uh, right now. As I said uh, before, maybe uh, we go into the current Rwandan system. I have to maybe to give uh, a background for interest of those who doesn't know uh, the Rwandan insolvency system. Um, the reform that have been conducted have started in 2009. Uh, before we used to have two old laws, the one from 1925 and another one from 1934 that will there to resolve, to prevent a solvency. And the other, the, the one from 1934 was for the commercial insolvency. Uh, then uh, the reform that we that have been made in 2009, especially for the insolvency law, it has been borrowed. The, we, we, the structure that the insolvency law took at that time was borrowed from Germany insolvency law. Uh, the Germany insolvency law uh, normally, the way it, it is designed, it has two steps, uh, which means when we file a case, an insolvency case in the court, uh, the court does not automatically um, uh, appoint a, the, an administrator or does not automatically declare the company insolvency. What the, 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 the judge do, he has first to appoint um, an interim administrator who will go and look into that business and the, 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 the judge appoint the data interim administrator as a, and there is also an interim creditors committee, which is go, which goes into the company. They do have like three months to look into financials and everything and come up with um, a proposal to the judge either to, 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 to liquidate or to restructure uh, the business or to administrate uh, the business. This, the, the, our 2009, uh, law was designed exactly um, compared to that uh, German uh, system. Uh, currently, uh, the law has been amended in 2021. And um, of course, there were so uh, many issues because, um, especially in practice, because we, do, we, we didn't have so many uh, expertise and tough of, uh, we could not manage to uh, differentiate uh, who is appointed an administrator and so forth. I'm going to explain the new, the new change that has been made since 2021. And uh, since 2021, now we, we have a new law that has somehow changed that process. Uh, currently, uh, when, uh, when you think that uh, a company can be restructured, you are, but you are struggling uh, to, to, to uh, to have a common understanding with the creditors, you can apply in the court in order to appoint an administrator uh, to restructure your, your, your business. Or if you find that the company has failed, you can apply directly in order to, uh, to liquidate uh, the company. Before, it was not like that uh, from 2009. Uh, at that, that, that time, you, you, it was just to make an application that you are not managing to pay back uh, the creditors, you are having a sort of a financial issues. Uh, then uh, um, up, it, it was up to the interim administrator to propose the best solution for uh, your uh, your situation. As of now, uh, the main actors under one law for this insolvency process, there is a, a data, is creditor. We do have a commercial court, and uh, we do have a judge in charge of insolvency. And we have the Registrar General. We have also insolvency uh, practitioners. Uh, the changes that has been made uh, in 2021 is that now an insolvency practitioner, um, they do have uh, different responsibilities. 
if you are appointed to uh, to restructure or to administrate the the business you are called administrator if you are appointed to liquidate the business you are a liquidator if you are appointed to to supervise uh, the compromise or arrangement with creditor you are called a supervisor then uh, if you are appointed also to supervise a trust a, 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 a bankruptcy a bankrupt person you are called a trustee those are the changes that um, have been made especially in 2021 and also uh, the process to start the insolvency proceedings the rwandan system is uh, a court-based insolvency system which means any decision related to insolvency has to be uh, approved uh, by the court by the commercial court and uh, in Rwanda, the particularity is that I think uh, we have the Registrar General of Companies, who is also the Chief Insolvency Administrator, who have a lot of uh, responsibilities in terms of uh, insolvency proceedings here in Rwanda. Uh, first, he's the one who, who license, who give the license to practitioner as insolvency, uh, insolvency practitioner in, here in Rwanda which means you cannot carry out this, um, you cannot be appointed as an insolvency uh, practitioner if you don't have that license from the Registrar General of Companies. The Registrar General of Companies also as Chief Insolvency Administrator, he's the one mandated to apply in the court in case uh, the, the, the administrator is not performing well uh, uh, its activity, which means uh, it is the one who make that application in order to to replace that administrator. He can intervene in any kind of insolvency proceedings. He do have that capacity. He can even uh, start an insolvency process against a company. He has also uh, that, uh, that capacity. And also um, uh, the, the process, insolvency process here in Rwanda in, for the administration of the company the first application is made to the Registrar General for the Registrar General uh, to appoint an interim administrator who would be uh, confirmed at the, later, at the later stage by uh, by the court when when he, he will present um, a report uh, saying that that company can be uh, restructured. Uh, the, the Registrar General is a key person in our uh, insolvency system because it, it, it he has a lot of uh, responsibilities is the one who approve after at the register stage uh, the the report from the administrator or liquidator uh, before in case of liquidation before uh, the company can be removed uh, from from the the registry um we as I said, um, we, we do have different type of insolvency proceedings. Uh, the one that can be made before a company uh, can start a proper insolvency process, the court process. Uh, the one that the, the, the court, the, 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 uh, the company can do, we do have arrangement and the compromise with creditors. Uh, those are the system that we, the, those are the process that we will integrated uh, to facilitate like uh, people having loans, big loans, and um, uh, they have mortgaged or they have provided securities on their asset, and they may find that um, that loan, the way uh, the business going is you cannot manage to pay back the loan and also pay uh, other creditors that he has. Um, in that case, you can negotiate uh, with some specific creditors and have an compromise agreement when you are a company or have an arrangement when you are an individual uh, business, which means the arrangement with the, the creditors it has been designed for individual persons who are in a business to negotiate with uh, some of the creditors uh, so that um, they can find a, an interim solution that would help uh, the company for not going into a proper insolvency uh, process. 
Um, and the compromise is designed for, uh, has been designed for companies. Uh, then when the company uh, has failed to negotiate with those creditors and they find that they have to start uh, the insolvency proceedings, we do have uh, to also uh, different ways. We do have uh, administration and the organization. It is whereby you find that uh, the company, uh, if you appoint an administrator who can come and negotiate with, uh, uh, with uh, the creditors, you can, um, the, the business can be rescued. Then in that case, you start a reorganization process in the court. And when you find that um, the, the, the business uh, has failed, you, the company cannot be rescued, you have to start the liquidation process. The liquidation, we do have, uh, as you know, two process. There is a compulsory, there is a voluntary liquidation. But the Rwandan law, you cannot do a voluntary liquidation when you find that the, the, the asset of the company is less than um, the, is less than the the credit or uh, the the credit from you you have from uh, from the creditors, uh, which means you cannot start a voluntary liquidation as long as you are not, you cannot be able to um, to pay back or uh, the the money you owe to or the creditors, and there is a particular um, a distinction I think. Uh, I have seen, uh, of course, there are some other jurisdictions who who have the same uh, definition. Under one I know the bankruptcy. Uh, the, the bankruptcy um, is especially designed in the case of individual persons. When the individual person is not managing to pay its creditor, it is a, who is in a business, it is whereby uh, the, that person is in a bankruptcy, uh, which is different from other jurisdictions, uh, even most of this African community. Uh, you cannot, here in Rwanda, you cannot say bankruptcy in case of company. The bankruptcy is, is a specific um, process for an individual uh, person. Uh, then, the uh, the insolvency the um, the administration organization liquidation those are the ones that are specific for uh, uh, companies if you understand well um, uh, the, the insolvency process or the insolvency proceedings in Rwanda there we do have um, the way of resolving the insolvency uh, issues for individuals and others that are specific for uh, only uh, for uh, companies. Um, and also uh, what I can say in Adam, particularly under insolvency law, uh, in, when it comes to liquidation, uh, the distribution order, uh, under one law, the priority is given to uh, the, secure, the secured creditors. Of course, um, the 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 security laws, which means mortgage and the uh, security interest and movable property prevail to the insolvency law, uh, which means uh, when a secured creditor do has the right uh, to separate satisfaction, meaning that he has the right to take the asset that has, he has received as security from the assets that are being used in the insolvency process. Uh, but of course, um, before he can do it, uh, the losses they, there is an automatic stay for three months. If the uh, the appointed administrator doesn't manage to uh, to provide um, a restructuring uh, plan to the court, the secured creditor can easier uh, request a, a separate satisfaction. And if the, the creditor didn't do that in the distribution order, he's the one that is paid uh, first after the cost of um, ad administration of the business. And uh, then after comes the creditors who has the right to return an asset, those especially for movable properties. And uh, as you can see, uh, the salaries and uh, salaries for employees, they comes after. 
then social security contribution uh, and government tax comes before unsecured claims. Uh, before, uh, then the last one is the if there's something that uh, has the surplus to from the liquidation that is given to the data. As you can see, under one I know the government tax, social security, they don't have the priority of the over the secured creditors. Uh, that is the process that has been uh, they adopted by um, by the Rwandan law. Uh, then uh, we we have some concept from cross border insolvency. I can say, but it's still yes. Um, this they, we still have some vacuum vacuum in regard to cross border insolvency. Uh, but if there is um, an insolvency process that has started. Um, abroad and uh, that company do have subsidiaries or assets here in Rwanda. Um, we do have a process where those uh, uh, the appointed administrator outside Rwanda, a foreign administrator, can come and um, uh, on on can come and take assets that are based in here in Rwanda. Uh, the the process first is to to make sure that the the High Commercial Court approves that, uh, recognize that judgment. And from there, this uh, foreign administrator can start um, operate uh, here uh, in Rwanda. Um, I, I would say that um, currently, uh, the, based on the COVID uh, issues, uh, the, most, um, the most proceedings that is being used is the those compromise with the creditors uh, because the most of people that he will affected are the business who would have uh, runs with banks. Uh, they negotiate with uh, uh, with the banks so that they, they their own can be uh, restructured before they can go into uh, into uh, a proper insolvency uh, proceedings. Uh, thank you. That. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Thank you for sharing the uh, the protections which the the creditors, I mean the the, the debtors have under the Rwanda law, and it is. Uh, it is very new to me that uh, I didn't know that voluntary, voluntary, voluntary service could not cannot happen when the data cannot satisfy the debts. So anyway, this will come in during the Q and A questions. Now let's go to the Council of Victoria. Council of Victoria from Uganda is going to to tell us in the next 10 minutes council victoria try to try to manage the time and so because we need this webinar is for the participants in the room so we need to give them enough time uh, victoria is going to to discuss the uh, how how to address the chain disruptions and raising operation costs First, by companies in in post COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I think that this presentation is not limited to Uganda, but the lessons made from Uganda will will also be lessons to other other countries because this is typical in economics. Victoria, take the yeah. floor, please. Good. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to, to welcome you and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, we are going to have a discussion stemming from the chain disruption and uh, rising operation costs faced by companies. Um, so basically, chain disruption is the interruption of the flow of the process that involves any of the entities associated with production, sales, distribution of goods and services. As you have heard, or as you know, in 2020, we had the COVID pandemic, which brought uh, 
the, the lockdown and it had a, an immense disruption in the supply chain globally. So as a result, we had uh, mainly, there were various causes of this disruption. And I can just briefly tell you a few of them. We had uh, COVID prevent, prevent, preventative measures that that is the lockdown <clears throat> that was generally in almost every economy. Then we had we have the ongoing Ukraine-Russian conflict, which has hiked uh, and brought about the vulnerability of the supply chain. Here we had issues of, of oil and gas issues that spilled over to the world. Then we have trade wars. We have uh, raw material shortages that were highlighted by China and its zero COVID policy, where there was strict lockdown and the world could not access China, which is the hub of cheap raw materials. So that was also a problem. Then another, another supply chain disruption we had that all of you people could have taken notice of was the ever, ever given ship, that is uh, one of the largest containers that got stuck or got blocked at the Suez Canal. And this was for six days. This disruption brought about delays and uh, billions of dollars were stuck at the sea. Then we have um, inflation and uh, climate change. So as a result of, of those challenges, we've had consequences that have arisen out of the uh, supply chain disruption. These consequences are briefly um, financial losses to companies, increased freight charges, heavier tax burdens and fines, then bad loans. Um, of course, there has been an increase in, um, in uh, labor costs arising from inflation, increased raw materials, energy and labor, and all this has brought about a heavy burden on, on different companies and individuals. Consequently, companies have been unable to meet their financial obligations as and when they have been due. And this brings about uh, the insolvency, the insolvency issue or insolvency practice. But I'll basically rely on the on the Ugandan approach here because um, we have uh, we have various laws that can help resuscitate a company that is dying or a company that is insolvent. And this is um, the Insolvent Act of 2014. I mean, Insolvent Act 14 of 2011, and this has been recently amended in 2022. Then um, we have the Companies Act was um, formerly there was a Companies Act Cup 110, but we recently had a new one, which is uh, Companies Act of 2012, which provides for various remedies in case um, we find a company is insolvent or unable to meet its, its uh, financial obligations. These um, include um, rescue mechanisms such as liquidation, receivership, administration, and arrangement, which uh, uh, are a way of uh, helping companies that are almost dying or dying companies for that matter. So um, we have a test of insolvency. How do we know that the company is now insolvent? I'll briefly highlight them. We have uh, the cash flow test. Um, the balance sheet test and also the capital adequacy test. Basically, the cash flow test can a company meet its day to day needs, financial needs. Then, balance sheet that one is limited to accountants, they are the ones who understand it better. But basically, these are books of accounts of, uh, of, account of a company. Does it, the, do the books reflect a good financial standing in the company? Then, um, the capital test. Does the company have finances to last to manage the company? And if it doesn't have, then what next? If a company does not meet its financial obligations, how, how are we going to rescue it? How is the company going to be helped? Is the company going to die? Is the company going to be resuscitated? How does the, the Ugandan law approach this? So we have... Uh, Various, we have um, corporate rescue mechanisms and uh, and other rescue mechanism. We have the formal and the informal. So here we have uh, we have um, 
arrangement that can help a company which is almost which is almost insolvent and these are provided for under section 124 to 134 of the insolvency act and uh, section 236 of the companies act which provides for creditors meeting to consider the proposed arrangements and procedures to follow the arrangement orders notice of arrangement and the if and the subsequent effects so this arrangement will help a company instead of going to into insolvency it will help a company be brought back to life however also we note in this in this arrangement scheme of arrangement there are exceptions where one has to seek leave of court and it is it court grants this this exception to the scheme of arrangement, but with terms and conditions. We can we see that um, the scheme of arrangement allows a compromise or arrangement to be agreed upon between the company and its creditors. This procedure involves an initial approach of court by the company or creditors or members. And it, it is good that it helps the company be brought back to life. Then we see there's also the company voluntary arrangements. This is a corporate rescue mechanism that enables a company to enter into a binding arrangement with its creditors. The company voluntarily arranges to, to, to meet its creditors and they come up with, with a compromise. Still, this is also catered for under the Companies Act and also it has a common law backing. So um, briefly, I also highlighted some of the cases that um, have talked about uh, this arrangement. The, um, and I cited a case, um, Commissioners of Inland Revenue versus Wembley Dodd Football Club Limited and others. Um, the company here, there was a voluntary arrangement regime which was intended to be an additional and particularly flexible option in the case of corporate insolvency. In addition to liquidation and administration and administrative receivership. Here we first start with that, then the company, if it fails, they can go to the other remedies that are available. Then also we have the remedy of uh, compromises. Still, this is provided for under both the Insolvency Act and the Companies Act, which uh, this, this promotes and provides companies or a company and its creditors, how will they equally meet their obligations, which is also something good. Then uh, we, have, uh, we have receivership. Receivership, this is a process initiated by an insolvent company by which the assets of the insolvent company are sold and the proceeds are given to the creditors. Um, receivership commences when the company appoints its receiver and it's made by court and the receiver accepts his appointment. These are all provided for under sections 178 to 182 of the Insolvency Act and also section 176 of the Companies Act. Um, when you get time, there's, there's a brief write-up I have written and also you might also want to acquaint yourselves with our laws. So you can, you can write this down. Then we have um, administration. This was also highlighted. I noticed my, my colleague earlier highlighted them, the one from Rwanda. So I've seen some similarities. We are not far off. Um, administration, this is when a company becomes insolvent and is put under control of a licensed insolvency practitioner. We have um, provisional administration, and I think this is one of of the things that has been common and has even been put to test in the Ugandan jurisdiction. Uh, provisional administration is provided or laid out in sections 139 to sections 143 of the Insolvency Act of 2011. And uh, there has been a decide, couple of decided cases, but I only highlighted two. Um, one, it was in the matter of Sunshine Agro Products Limited in administration 2019, where Justice Sekana noted, provisional administration provides breathing, to, breathing space to achieve a turnaround or structured exit that is designed to, to, to build a business, to hold a business together while plans 
are formed either to put in place a financial restructuring to rescue the company or to sell the business and assets to provide better results for the creditors than liquidation. So we see this is um, a better option than liquidation. And it's, it's more, of, let me put it in, in this context, that if somebody is very, very ill, we give, the hospital tries to give somebody medication to bring them back to life. Or if somebody is in a coma, they resuscitate mm -hmm. you, do everything possible to see that you get back to life. Then it has also been tested in the case of Uganda Telecom Limited versus Odama miscellaneous application 12 of 2018, where Justice Mubiru noted that under Section 140 of the Insolvency Act 2011, it is evident that provisional administration is a rescue mechanism for insolvent companies, which allows them to carry on running their business in order to stabilize the company's position and maximize its chances of continuing in business as an alternative to liquidation. A company seeks provisional administration with the aim of ensuring its survival. Therefore, according to section 143, subsection one, provisional administration puts an immediate ring fence around the company and its assets so that no creditors can start or continue any action of recovery. So here we have seen a provision administration, administration, but uh, also we see that it is, it is the best mechanism to protect um, to protect companies because when we are under provisional administra administration, we see that nothing can be commenced. Debtors cannot collect their money. We see that you can't you can't uh, the company cannot go under receivership. There are lots of things that cannot be done. The company because the main aim is to bring to resuscitate the company and bring it back to life so this is a better option than liquidation and it has its ring fences so everybody can try and use that then we see administrative receivership administrative receivership is where an administrative receiver is appointed by a floating charge holder an administrative receiver aims not only to settle the claims of a floating charge holder, but also restoring the Victoria, company to two minutes, two minutes, profit. Victoria. Okay, to its profitability. Then now uh, we see we had um, an amendment. There were amendments in our law which brought about new things. It brought about uh, the the cross border insolvency, where we repealed some laws that were going to to complicate. Um, uh insolvency practice across borders we see that um, we brought new offenses on board and um, then there was also unlawful dealing with assets that is an offense then we reduced the, the laws of bankruptcy from uh, five years to two years then also we can see that there was a, a post arrangement financing or post administration financing this happens after, what happens after all these proceedings have been completed and this new property discovered? How are you going to deal with it? So that was uh, one of the, some of the amendments that were brought about, that there was um, an amendment in the interim protective orders and administrative orders. Also, we see that there's also an access to data. This, this was also included in the new amendment of 20, 2022. And also um, about the qualifications of an insolvency practitioner. We also see that um, we, as a way of enhancing cross-border insolvency practice, we brought about the United Nations Commission on International Trade Laws, and these were incorporated in our, in our laws to enhance cross-border insolvency and remove any technicalities that could be could be involved with insolvency practitioners with different jurisdictions. So um, I, I, I was highlighting that Uganda is a progressive is progressive in this area, as we have seen that it has tried to conform to to other jurisdictions, and also we have there have been amendments to bring about various things which are making it a little bit easier for for people who are almost insolvent to be brought back to life. And that uh, is my presentation for now, but uh, I also wanted to highlight that 
perhaps we have challenges from different jurisdictions where we have conflicting laws but uh, as a result of, of of this committee we shall we shall Victoria. Hello, Victoria. Okay, can I, can, can another panel hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I think our colleague Victoria um i think she has some technical issues but i think she was she was she was, she was almost coming to an end thank you victoria we you, that you join us again so let's go to yes victoria yes uh, basically um i was concluding and i was just saying there's a need to harmonize our laws with the different african african east african community member states to harmonize our laws for a better insolvency practice. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for that. We will we'll come back to you during Q&A session. Uh, let's go to uh, Councillor Tabita Maniki. Councillor Tabita is going to talk about, is going to tell us about um, analyzing the impact of the inflation energy costs and the liquidity concerns on insolvents. Tabita, this is take your floor and please uh, once again a question that we try to to, <clears throat> to shorten our presentation. We have we speak more during QA session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Isaac, for the invitation. Uh, I want to share the Kenyan situation. I'm trying to share my screen. I don't know whether that is, I have it right or I have gotten it wrong. Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen. Um, But in the meantime, even as I share my screen, uh, we are trying to just, um, just give me a minute. Uh, let's see whether I can get this. Um, um, can you see anything? Yes, you can see your. Okay, I I know because the the law is almost uh, similar in uh, many of these. It may appear as if we are uh, being repetitive, but we will. Um, can you still see? Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the beginning of the slide. We can see, we, we can see your slide. Oh, okay. If you can see my slides, then um. Well, you on slide yes. nine? I'm on slide nine. Am I on one now? No. No. Okay. 
Um, right. You are there. I'm at the beginning now. Yes. Okay. No, you are on, you are on number two. I am on number two, trying to get to number one. But um, there you are. You are I am there. on number one now. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so what uh, what we are saying is, uh, as we look at the impact of inflation and uh, and uh, soaring global prices and all that, is to realize that the law is, is always always responds to the economic and uh, the social factors that affect uh, society. So inflation has hit uh, many countries, even those who in the past have been immune are no longer immune has hit countries from the US to Sri Lanka, everywhere. And as Kenya, we have been hit hard too. The rising prices of basic commodities have left uh, most of the people wondering what's going on. The Russia's war in Ukra on Ukraine appeared to be happening so far, but it has had a, an impact with the rising of crude prices and the high levels of uh, commodity prices, it has come to affect us even here in East Africa. Uh, most of our wheat, actually, uh, most of our wheat we realized used to come from Ukraine and Ukraine is now exporting 60% less of its total wheat uh, products from the past. And so this has impacted the our economy, um, climate change, poor weather has also impacted our ability to produce food. And so with the short supply, the prices have gone up and inflation has been rising by the day. But uh, what are some of, the, some of the drivers of inflation in Kenya? So apart from uh, the pandemic, and the impacts of the Ukraine war. We also have local factors that have been affecting inflation, uh, corruption, mismanagement. We all know that um, it has a very far reaching impact on the economy because it means that uh, people have to pay for more, more for services that uh, other people are getting free. And uh, it also means that um, even private entities cannot properly plan because if you are given a government tender to do some work, you're also not sure when you will be paid. And this has really, this has a very bad impact on business. So corruption and mismanagement is one of the drivers of inflation. Then we have a weak currency. Um, our shilling against the dollar has just been going up and uh, it has declined so much uh, since the beginning of the year and uh, partly because of the fact that uh, also other countries whose uh, currencies we use to measure ours have also been going through difficult circumstances. Tax, of course, when problems come, um, everyone is looking for a way to make ends meet. And one of the ways that government has uh, found of um, making it survive is to raise the taxes. And of course, the ripple effect on business is really something we cannot underestimate. Then we have the market structure. The lack of competition in some of the sectors makes it uh, easy for owners or cartels to, to manipulate prices. Um, of course, we have the competition authority but its reach and effect has not really been felt apart from recently when they uh, gave penalties to them to the businesses in the steel industry for actually engaging in anti-competition practices and uh, making the prices of steel skyrocket. Uh, what are the effects of uh, rising inflation rates? Of course, we have the lost uh, purchasing power. People have less money, so 
less disposable income so they are not able to buy and this of course affects business because then they have products but the people are not able to buy then we have higher prices of course for everything because production costs also increase with the energy costs going up with the uh, less liquidity the prices of commodities go up then we have slow economic growth we have higher interest rates as they try to manage the inflation. We have lower exports because production is not as good. We have lower savings. So even the money market is not as good. We have malinvestments. We have inefficient uh, government spending. We have tax increases. We have anti-inflationary measures that sometimes can cause a recession. So trying to balance uh, this uh, is not very easy. But what can be done? Of course, some of the short-term solutions have been uh, things like price controls and subsidies, but this cannot be, be sustained for a long time. And hence, they are really not recommendable. Um, here in Kenya, we have seen what uh, price controls and subsidies on UNGA has, have done to us. They were not really sustainable. Then we have the raising of interest rates uh, so that they can reduce the money in circulation. The only challenge we have is that um, Kenya is still largely an informal economy and 80% of the jobs are still outside the formal setups. So operators in the formal economy do not always borrow from the formal channels. So adjusting interest rates sometimes has a limited impact. Deliberate increase of supply of commodities by allowing competition, competitive import, importation of maize and wheat. This will increase uh, the supply and reduce the price. But you realize with our shilling weakening against the dollar, we almost don't have enough to have uh, more imports so that we can have an oversupply. Then competition um, is one of the most powerful weapons against uh, inflation. When uh, people have healthy competition, then the prices of commodities are able to come down. Uh, increase in the production, increase in production of whatever is in shortage of course is very important because it then um, lowers the prices. For example, in Kenya, we only produce 39% of our national wheat consumption, but we have a lot of land. If it is put for agriculture, then we can be able to increase our own production of wheat and rely less on imports. Then, uh, we also need to um, work on uh, innovation and efficiency because really that is what we need so that we can have more production, um, we can have uh, more production of food. And when we have more production of food, then the prices come down. But of course, this requires a lot of uh, research and uh, putting funds into research and development and changing cultures so that we can be able to focus on those things that matter. And also cutting down on red tape and bureaucracy, because these are some of the things that uh, make us uh, inefficient and also inhibit uh, our production levels. Then uh, we also need to have, um, uh, to have laws and ensure laws that create competition, but also ensure that these laws are being um, enforced properly so that they can have impact. We also must create an environment for companies to thrive and in situations of financial distress or a legal, a legal framework then that enables them to bounce back. And I believe this has been the clarion call by the World Bank and other institutions that have really advocated for the revamping of the insolvency, insolvency laws. So in Kenya, we 
amended our insolvency law in the year 2015. Previously, insolvency was um, administered under the Companies Act for, insol for limited for corporations, limited liability companies, and other unincorporated bodies. And the Bankruptcy Act, CAP 53, uh, dealt with the individual bankruptcies. But with the enactment of the Insolvency Act 2015, the two are combined. And now we have a more progressive act, which um, has borrowed heavily, of course, from the Insolvency Act of uh, the UK. And uh, one of the greatest uh, amendments, one of the greatest things that we have brought into our insolvency regime are mechanisms to address um, insolvency situations and provide rescue so that companies don't have immediately when they get into trouble to quickly rush to liquidation. They have um, other solutions that can give them time to be able to restructure and continue to operate as going on concerns. Um, the Act, of course, seeks to ensure a balance between the insolvency entity and the creditors by providing a framework for the efficient and equitable distribution of the assets of the insolvent entity, enabling insolvent companies whose financial position is redeemable to continue operating as a going concern so that they may ultimately meet their obligations, providing a better outcome for the creditors and they would, they would likely that would likely be in case the in, insolvent entities were declared bankrupt or liquidated and providing for an orderly manner of liquidating the assets of an insolvent company that are re irredeemable and ensuring efficient and optimal distribution of the assets for the benefit of the creditors. Uh, this scorecard on the impact of the, this is a scorecard on the impact of the Insolvency Act uh, since it came into operation uh, in the year 2015, the light, the right green, the green, the green, sorry, the right green is the petitions for liquidation. You realize that uh, old habits die hard, despite there being other rescue mechanisms. The most applications that we see are petitions for liquidation and um, the the darker green are voluntary liquidation proceedings um, the, the yellow is the receivership proceedings and the orange is administration proceedings so you can see that um, we are still yet to take up the administration proceeding seriously. We are still high on um, petitions for liquidation. Now, this tells us that there needs to be more education. There needs to be more sensitization of the, of the people, of the benefits that we can get from engaging the other solutions that have been put in the act to support businesses and help them to bounce back if they need to. And also to safeguard the assets of the institution, even if they will finally land in liquidation. Uh, let me say this at this point, from my experience in the, when I worked at the office of the official receiver is that by the time a company is uh, going into liquidation, they have developed such bad relationship with their creditors that their creditors no longer trust them. And so whatever they say they are after is always taken with a pinch of salt. And therefore it becomes very difficult to, to have um, these other processes go, go on. And we will see that as we, as we go further. So what are the key features of the- I have two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, of course, we have um, 
insolvency practitioners who are now the drivers of the insolvency uh, proceedings. We have moratoriums that give the companies time to be able to, to regroup and meet their debts. We have the role of the courts, of course, in the insolvency proceedings, which has been enhanced. Then we have the, of course, the, what we call the insolvency ladder that gives how the, the creditors are paid. We also have issues of the cross-border insolvency, which um, have been put in the new act to encourage trade uh, across borders. So the goals of the Insolvency Act is to encourage uh, going concern, continuation of the business entities, to improve efficiency, to help access to new capital uh, through the even the posts, the the the, the post um, the post insolvency proceeding borrowing to support the businesses. Uh, to have, have to have happy creditors who have been paid, preservation of the value of assets, debt restructuring and negotiation. These are the really the goals. So the types of insolvency proceedings we have administration, we have company voluntary arrangements, we have receiverships and uh, administrative receiverships also, and then we have liquidation. So both. Uh, voluntary uh, creditors liquidation and the other liquidations so we also have the the liquidators ladder the people who have the first priority in payment of course are the insolvency practitioner and the costs of running the insolvency but i want to skip that and quickly move to the um to the challenges uh, just uh, move to the challenges and I'll just mention them. You can see from the table that I showed you that liquidation is still the most popular option. And the reason for this could be lack of knowledge. It could also be that uh, the, they wait, the directors of the companies wait until it's too late and to be able to turn things around. And so liquidation ends up being the only way out. And uh, also sometimes lack of goodwill from the creditors can make it difficult. The other challenge we have is the high insolvency costs. The costs of the insolvency sometimes can be very high. The, the professional fees for the insolvency practitioners and all that. A, um, a case in point is the uh, the River Mining uh, Company that went first into administration, then into insolvency. The insolvency costs were 2.5 billion, which translated to about 40% of all the money that was raised to settle the creditors. And so we need to do something so that we can make um, these other these other insolvency procedures affordable by looking at the insolvency co uh, insolvency costs. Of course, we have the poor track record where many of the administration and uh, administration uh, proceedings have still ended up in insolvency. So people are wondering what's the point. So we just moved to insolvency direct. Of course, we have economic uncertainties which make it difficult even for the insolvency pro professionals to be able to recommend um, a strategies of turning around the, the companies. Then we have, of course, like I mentioned, the negative publicity around administration. They haven't worked, so uh, let's not do this. Getting into administration too late. You wait until it is too late, making it so hard uh, lack of goodwill from the companies in distress, of course, for administration and all these other procedures to work, there must be goodwill from the directors of the company, from the shareholders, from the creditors,
from the insolvency practitioners, from everyone who is involved in this process. There must be goodwill. So there must be transparent info sharing of information so that people can be able to make informed decisions. Um, we really need um, many success stories in this area of administration so that we can be able to change the narrative and people can be able to benchmark. And this, of course, will require early interventions, uh, transparent communication, um, coming up with methods of efficient asset realization, appropriate professional selection, being able to select uh, the the, uh, uh, an appropriate insolvency practitioner who is conversant in the area that the company is dealing with and therefore easier to make, uh, to give suggestions and also streamlining all the regulatory frameworks so that it is easy to do this. Uh, I want to end this session with sharing a with sharing a quote that is given in uh, one of the cases. And the quote was, was uh, by a, a bankruptcy court. And the court said, and the court was trying to talk about the issue of uh, early intervention. And it was saying that early intervention and um, making sure you make um, early decisions, decisions early enough before the company gets into trouble can be compared to a person who sits in the rain. Ordinarily, a person who sits in the rain can only get wet. And uh, there is no degree of wetness. You cannot say the person is now more wet. See, if they have been sitting the whole day, you cannot say they are now more wet at two than they were in the morning. They are just wet. But when it comes to insolvency proceedings, it compared the effect of not having early intervention, like a boxer who is in the ring. He fights, he fights, he fights, he starts being wounded, he continues fighting, and finally, he does not win, and ends up in hospital because he continued fighting. By saying that if this boxer had realized earlier in the fight that they are not going to win, then they would have stopped the fight before they have to be admitted to hospital. And I think this is part of what we need to, to, to encourage company owners that Sometimes you need to seek help early so that you can be able to turn around. Because however good our insolvency proceedings, uh, um, our insolvency law is, and however many options we provide, unless there is timely action, then they would not be effective and the corporate culture will not be able to catch up. Thank you for the opportunity to make my presentation. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Yeah. Uh, yes, time. We will get about 20 minutes of the participants in the room. Uh, Fred. Yes, Mr. Chairman. How, how, how many minutes can you... Can you give us? You've allowed them, them almost more than the minutes you had said, and now you want to <laughs> deal with me. <laughs> yeah. You have allowed the previous speakers more than their fair share. And no, no, no. I, you, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, did, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass the panelists by, you know, by. By basically stopping him or her, but I, I, we are, we are in a, uh, we are extremely late, and we, we have two remaining speakers. Please, yeah. just yeah. within that, 
within that uh, aspect of time, try to be brief. You know, we have more time in the Q and A session, and I know, and I know what you will not have presented. Um, you know, you you will, you will definitely have an opportunity during Q and Q and A question. And I'm encouraging participants in the room to post their questions. Just go in the Q and A. Uh, link it down uh, and then post your question, please. And then we will, we will begin with those questions during the Q&A Q &A, uh, session, the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we, we have uh, the same principles like anybody else, bankruptcies for individuals in Tanzania, the Bankruptcy Act Chapter 25 deals with bankruptcy of individuals. This is a, a law that was, was started 19, in 1930. It was a, a new law in 1945-47 until 1958. It's, not, it's quite an old law. It has not been changed much in terms of bankruptcy for individuals. For corporates, uh, we you have the Companies Act which uh, is the cap two and two of the laws of Tanzania. Uh, this was uh, uh, updated in 2002, and it introduced an, a, a better and a more modern uh, insolvency regime with voluntary winding up for both creditors and directors, as well as shareholders. They can apply for voluntary winding up, Administration has also been it was introduced in 2002, where you can petition a court, a creditor can petition a court, or uh, the company itself can apply to be placed under administration. And the issues of the administrative receiver, as in Kenya, uh, is very similar. Uh, this having in Tanzania, the situation of the the bankruptcy uh, or the insolvency. Uh, regime uh, is a bit, it's a bit um, uh, uh, disorganized in the sense that the legal framework governing insolvency in Tanzania has got several laws involved. One, the insolvency of individuals is administered by the official receiver, just like uh, we heard in Rwanda, Kenya, under the Bankruptcy Act. But we have cooperative societies, they Insolvency of such societies is administered by what, what we call the Registrar of Cooperative Societies, who is established under the Cooperative Societies Act. That's the second uh, institution dealing with insolvency. The third institution is the is, is, is insolvency of banks and financial institutions is by the BOT uh, through the Bank and Financial Institutions Act. They have a special unit there uh, dealing with insolvency. And in respect of uh, trustees, um, this is um, uh, deal, the issue of body corporates of trustees is administered by the Administrator General of Trustees established under the Trusteeship and Corporations Act. And finally, in terms of insurance companies, these are administered by the Commission of Insurance established under the Insurance Act. So you see there's a, there are several institutions involved in governing insolvency in Tanzania. So these laws do not establish mechanisms or legal framework that allows collaboration and coordination between the administrators of insolvency matters. So sometimes the lack, this lack of coordination has led to a situation where a person may be declared insolvency under a certain law, but continues to be solvent under another law. So in Tanzania also, we were supposed to look at inflation, energy costs, and liquidity, liquidity concerns. Um, for uh, about in the, in the past few years after COVID, fortunately, in Tanzania, we did never went to, uh, like other stuff. Can, can, we just uh, of wearing masks, cleaning hands, and social distancing. That was the, the minimum that the government uh, 
available to the rest is great uh, i I, th I think there are some we have some connection issues is it all right everyone Hello, hello. I, I, I was I was offline. I'm, I'm not okay. back. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of, uh, of, uh, of of the impact of, of 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 COVID, we did not have that great an impact, although people did uh, uh, pass on life and etc. But that did, was not a watershed incident in the in the in the, um, in the economy of Tanzania. In terms of uh, of, of uh, the impact of energy, rising costs also have always had a, a negative issue uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the businesses, and there has been uh, um, problems on uh, of um, of costs in terms of energy. The main costs of energy in the Tanzanian sector has been the disrupted flow of energy, especially mostly for the grid. But that has been addressed a lot by independent power producers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, has, that has, has, has not had a severe impact in the recent past, but it has had it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 10 plus years, we had serious shortages that had um, uh, 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 deleterious effects on, on, on businesses, which led to insolvencies. However, what what actions have been happening to businesses uh, uh, outside insolvency? That is, is outside take, taking insolvent measures. Many of the businesses that used to be in Tanzania, because of the of the electricity or because of the policies involved, le left the country. They left the country and went to other places they thought better some businesses even abandoned the, the the original businesses they used to do and converted to others we know for example around pugu road which is a which is a which is a which is a, an industrial area here in dar es salaam a lot of people are now uh lessors they they they've listed to other people to the chinese to other people because they they couldn't run their original uh, uh, businesses uh, uh, because of the, the, the impact of inflation and, 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 and energy costs. Uh, we have seen an increase in voluntary winding up. As people have started to understand that they can voluntarily wind up, there has been uh, 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 a lot of that. And bankruptcies. Bankruptcies of individuals, that is, uh, is, 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 is well known, but we do not have records as yet to show how it has impacted small businesses and, and individuals who are non-incorporated. However, in terms of the corporate world, we, we have the records of the non-performing loans with banks. There's a, there's a serious uh, 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 portfolio of, of non-performing loans in banks and a lot of providing, there's a lot of provision uh, under the central bank on these things. However, um, the like in Kenya, or oh, the, the two the test the two tests of insolvency apply. That is bank balance sheet um, uh, 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 approach and the so the cash flow approach. Both of them also apply in Tanzania. The in terms of uh, um, uh, the administration, the, the forms of, 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 of insolvency uh, processes. We, we, we have all the processes that require the administrative receiver, the administ administration, uh, et cetera. But one of the things that uh, we, do, we have not seen a rise in is something called informal workouts. 
uh, they have, these are possible, but we have not seen them in common use in Tanzania. Uh, in terms of cases, okay, sorry, let me just first start on, start on um, let me just look at, uh, uh, in terms of cross-border insolvency, I had uh, one of the lady from Uganda, I think, was talking about cross-border in, 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 in processes. We, 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 are, we are looking at the unicitral model law, but this, this law has not been ratified by Tanzania. So it cannot be implemented until such ratification has, 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 has been done. Uh, in terms of restructuring, all that can be done, etc. Now in Tanzania, we have, a, it's a different from other countries. The first person to be paid in terms of the payment waterfall, the first payment to be done is to the statutory creditors. And these in Tanzania means that, first of all, the, the TRA, the, the Tax Revenue Authority, workers and the pension uh, funds, and local authorities. Those are considered statutory. Then the secured creditors in terms of those who have taken uh, security for loans. Then unsecured creditors, finally shareholders. That is as far as you look at the payment order for in case of any uh, uh, insolvency issue. In terms of uh, when I look at the modes of insolvency that, is, that, that are, are trending, we, we in winding up, winding up is still the preferred as, as the last uh, mentioned, uh, as, as last speaker mentioned, we have winding up cases. And we look at, at the courts, courts have become very adept in handling winding up cases. They have been doing that for quite some time. The only problem that we are having in terms of how the court looks at uh, uh, is the administration cases. Administration cases are the are, are new, let, let me put it that way. And even as because of their expense, they are, they, they are also looked with, 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 with caution and askance. Uh, 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 in terms of or how they they they, they uh, impact on insolvency, um, I recall a case, a case called Nakumat. This is Nakumat is a Kenyan company, and they had formed a subsidiary called Nakumat Tanzania Limited, and uh, they the Nakumat Limited they had uh, 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 taken out a loan uh, with Kenya Commercial Bank and two others. And the court looked at the, um, the, 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 the case for an application that Nakumat made. They wanted to be, to be continued as a going concern under an administrator. So it was a company application to place itself under an administrator. And the court said what would satisfy it to grant an order for administration, it required sufficient information regarding how the company is intended to be turned around to achieve status of a going concern. And the court was very particular that it wanted to disclose the existence of any stocks, where the whereabouts of such stocks and its value. They wanted market and management strategy to turn it around, commitment from shareholders by way of injecting capital to support the petition, that the places of business are, still exist, and also the proposed administrator's report or proposal, how to achieve the status of a going concern, and how it is going to reduce liabilities and the bailout, a, a, a required bailout. So uh, without that, without showing those things, uh, it refused to grant Nakumat Tanzania Limited that its application and it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was wound up. Uh, in terms of, um, 
In terms of other issues that came up in other cases, like the Matthews de Clark versus Cassava Starch, this was also a, a request by a company to place itself under an acquisition order. The court looked at that and uh, and it granted that 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 uh, that request or that application because of the following reasons one the company has never been under an administrative receiver two now for the order sought is that the company still has a viable long-term business and an assured market three the issues from their creditors that require the court protection the creditors were seeking to wind it up four that they had a board resolution which contained proposed remedial actions which could turn around the company and finally there was a special resolution from the the minute of the agm which was annexed to the petition showing that they supported this um, application and the court granted the the, the, um, the application uh, the other thing that that what, what makes administration expensive and also uh, not yet uh, acceptable is the the court needs to administer it there is an extra work because you have to report every sometime one of the one of the cases i i, I mentioned the matthew matthew's case the court wanted every quarterly i found it a bit odd because that's very expensive for every quarterly to produce a report to the court uh, me being having been an administrator for four years of the company i know that's a very tedious work and therefore they made said they wanted to make sure that uh, they, they, they had a good eye on the uh, on the institution and that itself required the administrator report and they actually stated what they wanted report reported they wanted the contract negotiations the business correspondence the production data the personnel files the financial statements notice to creditors minutes of meetings of creditors appointment of proxy proof of debt or claim form at line of deed proposal and there was a serious amount of, of documents that the court said these were supposed to be reported on No, Frederick. Yeah, I think you've lost Frederick again. And his presentation was really spiral. He was touching on the case law. Frederick, are you trying to reconnect? Yes, I, yes I'm trying to connect, reconnect. Have I reconnected? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Now. Yeah. I, yeah, I want to finish you. off. I want to finish off with the challenges that we're facing in insolvency in Tanzania. Uh, I, the first challenge is the multiplicity of laws governing insolvency. We may need to go the route of most of the others that uh, we have a single law in terms of insolvency. Um, the next is uh, the issue of cross-border insolvency that needs to be addressed. And then there's prolonged litigation in insolvency matters. There's a lot of litigation. You, once you take up whether you're an administrator or an administrative receiver, it's, there's a lot of litigation that, that starts. Okay. And then there is the issue of protection of depositors in insolvency. This has not been addressed in our laws. Then the employee, employee protection. That also is an issue. Regulation of insolvency practitioner is still an issue. And so these are the major challenges, the facing uh, insolvency practice in Tanzania. And this impinges on the stakeholders. First of all, the judiciary. The judiciary, there's too much, too long, the, the litigation process is too long. They, are lack, they, they lack judges and also we lack advocates who have adequate knowledge of, of, uh, of, of, of this matter. We have a case called Tritel. It was a, it was a, it was a mobile phone company. 17 years it was in the courts and, and, and that, that's that's too long 
and uh, the also the issues of delay uh, she I, I my, my colleague who just uh, presented did a fantastic job in respect of delay that uh, these delays do cause a lot of problems in in in, in Tanzania so, so let me leave, leave it for the others so that uh, they can also uh, contribute before we go and open the session thank you mr chairman thank you frederick thank you for that wonderful presentation i think we in during q and a quick session we'll be coming back to you yes. particularly on this telecom company was in service administration has been for 17 years maybe you have to explain to us more about that uh, okay. last but not least is Council Trevor Nigera from Burundi. Uh, Council Nigera is going to give, to share with us the perspective of insolvent law in Burundi. But I, I would request him that he, as he has been on this, on this, <clears throat> on this panel, in the interest of time, if he could just stick on any differences from other laws, because Previous uh, panelists have presented the their jurisdictional uh, legal framework on insolvency law, and the, if the only those that are different, which already has, I think would make make much more sense in the interest of time. Trevor, take the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, of course. Uh, has been uh, done easy because the previous presenters have um, uh, said about their jurisdictions and the situation is uh, almost mil similar with um, this uh, modern law with uh, this uh, concept of uh, of a cross border uh, insolvency, these concepts of um, ADR in insolvency. So I'll not be back on those concepts uh, for the interest of time, but also uh, they, are, uh, they were very well developed by the, um, uh, the, the previous presenters. Uh, one uh, item I mentioned is about the implementation of the law in my country. I don't know how it is about other countries, but even though we have a very good law with a um, very modern concept, uh, we are not seeing uh, many companies following the proper procedures. So uh, there is a lack of implementation. A bit, uh, because of the lack of awareness, lack of for companies, for practitioners, uh, for stakeholders in companies, shareholders, uh, management team, it, it is. So uh, this is an opportunity for us as lawyers uh, because uh, we can get that uh, challenge as an opportunity and uh, position ourselves as uh, uh, advisors, as uh, professionals. We can a bit on the forums that exist now, like uh, Insure International. I'm not advertising for them, but this is one forum one can join. Otherwise, maybe like a platform uh, uh, that is um, created by the, the, the lawyers in, the, in this region deal with the, these questions of, uh, of insolvency. So uh, basically, that's what I have to say to uh, give time to, uh, to participants to uh, ask questions and um, thank you chair thank you clever thank you for for that short presentation uh 
Yeah, you get you give an experience on applicability, uh, on practice of, of the insolvency law in Burundi. And uh, so this time is for our guests, uh, the participants in the room. We have we have questions. We have one. Um, I think we have one question that was presented by uh, trying to see. It was, uh, it was David. I just want to. It was David from Uganda. I see that some some were giving uh, asking for the for the slides, and I think it is Tabita who presented who who made some who had slides, but also Victoria Victoria had uh, a twenty four page um, word document that she shared with me yesterday. Um, Victoria. Are you happy that it will be, should be shared? Yes, you can share it. Okay, okay, I'll share it. Okay. Uh, David, where is it, David? David had the question and uh, it was, uh, he asked, no, it's, it's called, is, is it Kasami Polo Wingy from Uganda? He said, his question is, how do we, in, he said, regarding the emerging trends and opportunities within East Africa for cross-border insolvency, how do we intend to work around the conflict of territorial laws related to securities and the enforcement that may arise when it comes to recognition of foreign proceedings? Then he goes, no, he goes that's a question, he goes on to say that, I imagine that if I am appointed as a receiver in Uganda, and the debt has assets in Rwanda. How would we ensure that the conflict of laws between the law, the laws governing assets of the company in Rwanda and Uganda are harmonized to ensure a smooth recognition of these proceedings? How do we go about the protectionist and the protectionist and the territorial supremacy tendencies in the laws that could affect the recognition? And therefore affect the smooth practice of cross-border service. So this question goes, this question was not was not uh, addressed to any, any panelist. And so it, it is open to the panelists. And uh, would like to start, but let me start by by stating that uh, Mr. Paul, this question is very, 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 very relevant. Uh, so the purpose, the purpose of cross-border insolvency is actually to facilitate uh, an administrator in a foreign jurisdiction at the at the at the point uh, at, at the place where the the company, the, comp the company became insolvent is situated to access and uh, access and obtain and liquidate the assets in the foreign jurisdictions. So the importance of the of the uh, of the cross border insolvency, any laws that have got this that, that has adopted the Austrian model law on cross-border insurance, we find that they recognize the internet to, to allow jurisdiction to recognize the insurance, insurance practitioners from jurisdictions, different jurisdictions appointed 
for the purpose of the of the insolvent company. So the laws, indeed, the, the laws on securities, traditional collaterals, are very different. But in private, in private international, what I what is what is very common to me, if I remember, is that most of it comes to fixed fixed assets, the immovables. They are governed by the laws of the state where they are situated. Correct. So I think that the, the, the administrator who all the liquidator at that time, if you want to liquidate, then he will have to, to navigate around to see that, to see that his, his or her question, how her problem, are answered by the law where the pro where the assets are located. Of course, but we also have, remember we also have the law, the international law on private on conflict of laws. And I think that even, even the national laws have, have solutions in their laws to resolve conflict of laws when they arise. Uh, but I think that it would not, it would be difficult if the data has the assets in a, in a jurisdiction which has not embraced cross-border insolvency, I think it, it, it would really be difficult. But now, this time we are, talk, we are talking as a block of East African community. And, uh, and uh, one of the panelists, uh, I think it's Victoria, who say that we need, we, need to, we need to see the harmonization of insolvency law within the region. I think this is the law that really requires more, more harmonization than even in the tax laws. Tax laws are, are being more harmonized in East African community, but insolvency as the trade and investment between five, six country, member countries is increasing, I think it is important that even this insolvency law becomes harmonizing all in, in just for key aspects that would allow the insolvency practitioners to access, to have easy access of assets of the data in the foreign jurisdiction. Um, I would invite any other panelists to, 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 to say something about this question. There's any. Victoria, do you want to say something? Hello? Hello, Chair? Eve, do you want to say something? Yes, Hello? please. Yes, yes please. please. Eve, yeah. go on, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I think I have to give us some insight on how the cross-border insolvency is being handled here in Rwanda. Um, of course, uh, first of all, the appointed uh, practitioner outside Rwanda do have jurisdiction in Rwanda. Um, that is the principle. Uh, then when it comes to uh, the, uh, the court process, as I said uh, before, he may start uh, looking for assets that are based in Rwanda. He has to go to an approval from the uh, high commercial court. When um, uh, the one case that I've seen the way uh, the judge at the High Court has uh, has resolved the case, it is they they gives the what the 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 judge did. Uh, he called all the creditors to come and um, present their case because because the the assets are here in Rwanda. Um, the administrator want to take them want to sell them and take the proceed outside Luanda. Uh, then the judge what the, the judge did has given two proposals. Either first for the administrator to deal with those assets in Rwanda and pay all the creditors that are busy in Rwanda or facilitate the creditors that are here in Rwanda because they didn't um, follow those processes of registering their um, um, uh, their claims to uh, in, in 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 that country, and what and after after the 
they are registered also to to help them uh, to be paid on the proceed on what the 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 Rwandan creditors resolved was to allow the uh, that administrator to sell the asset in Rwanda and take back the proceed outside and register them on the list of the creditors outside and also get paid from outside Rwanda. This is how because uh, in general, even if um, uh, the administrator would have the power to come and uh, uh, deal with the on the asset have, which are here in Rwanda, the system tried to also to protect those assets that are based in Rwanda and also those creditors which are here in Rwanda to, to facilitate them uh, to, to be get paid because uh, of course they are not familiar with uh, uh, those laws um, which the administrator is applying. Yeah, this is how that case has been resolved and those creditors have been paid after uh, after the liquidation of all the assets. Thank you. Thank you, Eve, for that uh, for that uh, wonderful knowledge from the court. Uh, just just uh, just a follow up a question on that. So the the let's say the creditors in Rwanda who had the lien on the property here that uh, belonged to a data the data in a foreign jurisdiction. So for example, we have the we could have security creditors on that on that asset, and you could have unsecured creditors for on the on the data as a whole. So when the judge when the judge uh, gave option like to say to that London creditors be allowed to be registered in the foreign in you know in the foreign jurisdiction as a creditors. Now, would they be registered in the foreign jurisdiction according to their rank here? For example, security creditors here would also be security creditors in, in that foreign jurisdiction where the where the insolvents were commenced. Can you just try to clarify on that if you have uh, more knowledge on that or, or about yeah. the decision of the court? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Yes, the, 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 what the judge has tried to do was to make sure that uh, the right of the creditors are protected uh, based on Rwanda law, even it was even included in the final decision uh, that he made in order to allow the administrator to start uh, doing her, her job here in Rwanda. Of course, their right has been, have been kept, but uh, in this particular case, uh, all were unsecured creditors. Um, and I, I know, um, I think if there was one of them which were a secured creditors would have requested a separate satisfaction uh, so that he can uh, sell his asset without going on the list of other uh, secured creditors, as, as especially because he didn't know how much they are, how much the, the company owes to them, how many they are, all those kinds of details were not uh, really uh, presented. Uh, but um, for the, the interest of the uh, those unsecured creditors that were here in Rwanda, it was because uh, the, uh, the amount that the company uh, were, was owing to them was bigger than what the, the, the receiver could expect to uh, to receive here in Rwanda. This is why they have chosen to uh, to be registered on the list of other uh, creditors in order uh, to be paid uh, on uh, with others. Because um, here, the, what the administrators were saying that I was kind of somehow giving them comfort that um, the company do have a lot of assets that could help them to uh, to be paid. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Uh... In a, in, in a related question from Ferson Odongo, he, uh, it's not a question, I think it, it, it was an input. He said that Kenya Companies Act provides for cross-border insolvency 
for foreign companies registered in Kenya by providing for an appointment of a liquidator in Kenya, in addition to a liquidator in a foreign country. So if I understand this, this Kenyan uh, provision, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure, I, 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 you know, this, he said this is a company's act. It's not, I think he, so, the Kenyan Companies Act provides that there must be parallel, parallel um, proceedings. So if, if, a foreign, if a foreign investor in Kenya uh, goes on, uh, into administration in a foreign jurisdiction, and so and they, they have to they have they have to attach or, or to touch on his assets in Kenya. Then, according to Kenyan law, the foreign the foreign appointed liquidator will not have jurisdiction in Rwanda in Kenya, but instead the, there will be an, a separate and a, a parallel uh, liquidator who will handle the proceedings in Kenya. If I understand, uh, Tabita, is is, is this? Uh, what what do you have to say about this uh, from Ferson or Dongo? Sorry, I think I think that is the that is the position as uh, described by by Gabriel. It first takes care of the creditors in the in the country, other than letting them to go and rank outside, so that the assets in Kenya are used to first pay the creditors in Kenya, and the assets are not sold and the money pulled together to settle the creditors throughout. Okay, so, so basically the Kenyan law allows the parallel proceedings, but the Kenyan proceedings are triggered by the foreign proceedings, if I understand. Thank you, Ferson Odongo, for, for your input. Uh, then we have another question from Anonymous. And uh, I don't know how relevant this question is because he's asking Dr. Fred that in your, in your estimation, what, what was the impact of the government of Tanzania policy in preferring public operations over private companies in awarding public project contract between 2015 and 2021. Then how about the delayed payment to private contractors for completed works during the same period? Okay. I, I think Mr. Chairman, Sorry. Mr. Chairman, that, that, that is, a, um, that is a, because of the experience we had with, the, with under the five, uh, fifth phase government in Tanzania, there was a lot of infrastructure projects, but there was also high delays in paying those contractors. So some went under, some, some, some disappeared. Uh, individuals, uh, unfortunately, were hard hit because workers on, uh, went unpaid, uh, co co because contractors were not paid, subcontractors were not paid. And, uh, and 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 it was it was uh, it was an issue of, of a certain period in our, in our history where the government wanted the work but never was uh, we were quick to pay now i think that's where his question is is is, is what happens um the this current government had had, had paid almost uh, i think almost uh, it's almost to 800 billion or something to local contractors to clear off uh, local debts. Now, the implications, I don't know. I really don't know. It's, it's something for research. 
uh, what happened. But we know for a fact that a lot of construction companies uh, went under because of delayed payments from, and they could, they had, you know, you take bank guarantees, which you have to pay a fee. There's, there's loans that you need to pay, uh, repay and et cetera. And uh, you, you take uh, machinery by leasing from banks, et cetera. All these are issues that, uh, that uh, one needs to do research to come up with what, what was the impact, but it's not directly affected insolvency. Although banks went, although companies went under, but and we are we are not very sure whether there was much insolvent, insolvency uh, uh, in that in that during that stage. I don't have information, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Thank Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Um, yes, uh, the anonymous. I I think I I think you have. Heard that uh, Fred does not have a complete information such files, but at least has tried to give um, what he had. Uh, then there is uh, there is uh, Dominic Crono is saying in an insolvent suit, what would be a possible defense? I think that he's asking uh, that. In a case, in a case of, um, in a case the the insolvency petition is being is being challenged, probably probably it has been commenced by the creditor, and the data is challenging. Or the creditor, the creditor has, I mean, the data has commenced, has initiated, and the creditors are refusing, are refusing the the. Are telling the are telling the the application. Um, who, Victoria, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, have you had this question? What would be the defense? How, what would be the defense in the service petition? Um, Another. When you are challenging, when you are challenging an application, when you are challenging an application for for commencement of insolvency proceedings, what would be the defense? Uh, my understanding, because uh, the company is unable to meet its its financial obligation as and when it comes, um, the the defense that would be there would be most likely you have the reason you would have to give a reason for failure to meet your financial obligation. Most likely, you also perhaps like what they said um, about um, uh, companies owing money from the Tanzanian government, from construction and things like that. You would explain your reason for the failure to pay because you have also not been paid. So you you ask for simpler remedies like um, composition, and so that you're in position to pay when you when you get paid. Such such is what could possibly happen when you fail to meet your financial obligation. What is the reason for failure to meet your financial obligation? That would be in the defense. Also, earlier you had talked about the issue of uh, uh, cross border insolvency and uh, the issue of um, jurisdiction, which uh, which which is which is also a problem. Because uh, we have different laws across across the board, especially in the East African community, I have seen a random random law is is slightly similar to ours, but it's different. Then uh, the Kenyan law is is quite the same, like the Ugandan law, it's progressive. Then the Tanzanian law is totally different. But one of the things that will be used to determine the jurisdiction, maybe in in terms of insolvency is um comi that is um what is the common what is the the common area of interest where 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 are the where was the company incorporated where are the assets so that that helps in determining the jurisdiction but however as we had earlier stated one of the challenges is having to reconcile the laws within the community within the East African community. That is one of the things as uh, the committee, the insolvency committee, we should push for 
the recommendations and we should also push for for to see that all member states may be I, we can't push for ratifying the, the central mode, but uh, we should try and push for a uniform law across the board, seeing as we have some similarities. I hope you, that has you. answered the challenges at hand. Thank you. When, when, you, when you still have the mic, uh, can you elaborate more about the solvents test? Um, of capital adequacy. Maybe before she goes there, Mr. Chairman, can I contribute? Yes, please. Uh, some 15, 16 years ago, I had the same uh, uh, challenge. I was I was counsel for for a bank in in a court case, and the, we were we were trying to, to uh, uh, one of the companies from Kenya was trying to to liquidate or to, 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 to wind up, and, and I was looking for a winding up order against a, a company uh, here. And uh, the, 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 the company was actually uh, uh, failing to pay for some fuel that they had used for, 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 for one of the oil companies. And um, <clears throat> our defense was that the company continued to pay some of the banks and we could show that the, 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 the effect of payment, if you could show that they were paying, then this company not paying you is, is in financial distress rather than is, is insolvent. And so we managed to get that company out of, you know, we, we, we not challenge that winding up uh, petition by showing that there were transactions that were continuing to be traded and people were being paid, uh, save that there was just one person who's, uh, who's not patient enough to allow the, so that, the court accepted and we saved that company from being put under. So if there are defenses that you can raise, uh, but you have to have evidence to show that you are paying. Now, failure to pay a debt is not automatically, even in, in other jurisdictions, a, 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 a reason for winding up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Yes, Victoria. Yes. I had I had wished you to to explain to explain more this solvency test of capital advocacy. How does this differ from balance sheet? Pardon? Yeah, you in your presentation you mentioned three three, two three tests. solvency but tests. Yeah. For us to mention the three service tests in Uganda under Ugandan law, capital adequacy, cash flow, and budget tests. So I just wanted to know um, with, the, with the participants how the how is the, how, how capital adequacy is different from the distinctional feature between capital adequacy and balance sheet uh, service tests. Um, the the balance sheet the balance sheet test is the, in regards to to books of accounts the balance um, sheet test shows the company and how it is getting money and how it is spending how are its books of accounts is it bringing in finances that are going to be in position to to solve has the company paid its taxes how do the books of accounts stand. Well, as the capital adequacy test is, does the company have sufficient funds to, to sustain it in the event of, of uh, let's say, when, when people demand and things like that, does the company have capital? There's a, dif there's a difference between all these three tests that, we, that I had earlier say, stated. The cash flow test, does the company bring in money open? That one is different from the balance sheet test the balance sheet test is uh, mainly an accountability test. Does the, how do the books of account in a company stand? What is their balance sheet? What is the, 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 the cred, creditors stand vis-a-vis -vis the money in the company? Then the, the capital adequate test, does the company have sufficient capital 
to 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 stand that is what i understand between the three different tests that i had stated thank you victoria uh, mm -hmm. tanzania and kenya do we have similar in rwanda i think we have on the, we have a cash flow and balance sheet tests service tests what about in the, uh kenya burundi and tanzania do you have this capital test as well Fred? Hello? I think in Kenya, we don't have that. Um, we just have the, the earlier two. Okay. Red in Tanzania. Okay, uh, let me see from the chat box if I have another question. Uh, I just wanted to add the point on a question from Dominic Rono uh, about his, his question the, about the defense, the probable defense in Solomon's um, suits. I will personally give, I, I'll give a personal experience um which which shocked me uh in my service practice so this is a this is a this is a this is a company that i'm liquidating it is um, the parent company is in the uk and it has a subsidiary in the uae and the u.s subsidiary owns a subsidiary in Rwanda. And this company did not have, was in the financial services. It did not have any assets at all, other than office, office furniture, computers, just a few of those. It had the liabilities of about $3.6 million. And one major creditor was owed $2.6 million. The other, the other creditors that, uh, that shared the $1 million mainly were employees. So the creditor, I mean the debtor, tried to find an investor. And he got an investor from Switzerland who, want, who wanted to inject money um enter into debt arrangements with the creditors and uh, be able to pay uh, uh, be able to come to proceed with the with the business and then so uh he even he gave the part the the he gave uh, an, uh, an unrefundable commitment fee of 200,000 US dollars to the major creditor. The major creditor was the only one who knew that the company was actually was actually distressed. So they had the num uh, they had the month of negotiations, but the the parent company in the UK had it to be, it was listed on the UK London Stock Exchange, and it had to be it, it, it had to be approved by London Stock Exchange to be able to, uh, you know, to, to, to invest in that, to buy out of that uh, suffering business. So the business that, the business that suffered that went into administration was a subsidiary in the UAE. Uh, the, whole, the UK company was just, I would suggest just share company, it was just a holding company. So that was investing in different jurisdictions. So it did not have specific assets in the UK. So 
after after the investor failing to to meet in a, uh, to reach a section the negotiated settlement with the big with one big creditor so he went to court to ask for for protection of restructuring the business and it was an expert application but and then I, I don't know how the creditor came to know about this expert application and then he voluntarily joined the application and opposed the application. So initially, initially the, the, the data was succeeding, but because the data was licensed, was licensed by the central bank, was, it was in financial services, uh before the court could make a ruling on application for 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 restructuring uh the rest of the bank the central bank revoked the license and that became yeah, the sole reason for the court to reject the application. so the court stated that you are you are you are so business your business is the best is a is hinged on a license now the license has been revoked even though you may have capital or many investors to revamp the, the business but you cannot proceed without a license and so the court rejected the, the application but the question the question the question that still bothers um me and the other, other servants administrators in Rwanda is that what interest did the creditor have in opposing restructuring? The creditor did not was in, was not secured, was unsecured like any other. Now a lot of money, and so. That it had to to push the data to to the grave remains a question, and it's a, and it's an emerging trend in the insolvency practice that we have as insolvency practitioners we have to think that as much as we have these options of protections, but we have to remember that the major creditors always decide. And I'm assuming that even if the court had had granted the application, the restructuring application, still the insolvency administrator would have to would have to design a, a, a revamping plan, which would have to be approved by the by the creditors. So even at that time, the creditor would have to challenge and refuse that. And so we I think we have to understand the importance of the major creditors so in insolvency in insolvency uh practice but it comes to revamping the sustainability of, of businesses we need to have good relations and obtain a consent of the big creditors i think this is something i just wanted to to say that it was triggered by this question by the discussions we had on the question from Dominic Rono. So gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we have had the, uh, I think a good discussion on my point. And uh, the ELS was very um, kind to, ex to give us extension of 30 minutes. We have come to, we have, we have consumed the 30 minutes. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the participants. We had about 108 participants in the room. And uh, just in one, one 30 seconds each, may I ask each panelist, beginning from beginning with the Ivi Sangano, to make your closing remarks. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Iris, for organizing this important session. I think we will have, we'll be given opportunity uh, to discuss to discuss further on insolvency matter, uh, especially the cross border insolvency in ESC. I thank all uh, my colleague uh, panelists and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Tabita. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to participate in this uh, very important discussion. I think uh, we need to have more time to discuss, especially the issues of uh, corporate rescue, the various uh, options available, so that um, we can be able to utilize them more, advise our clients to utilize them more other than going straight for liquidation and also so that we can also iron out the issues of uh, cross-border insolvency and suggest amendments to our local laws where necessary. Thank you, Tabitha. I do agree with you that uh, even in Rwanda, the companies go, go, to, go to seek these protections when it is too late. Uh, Kreva, Kreva, your comments, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks to ERS leadership. Thanks to the committee. Thanks to panelists. And uh, thanks to participants. It was a very happy moment to be with all, all of you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Kreva. I don't see Fred here. I don't see uh, Victoria now. Let me hand over to. Gabriel Achaye uh, from ELS to, to dismiss us with dignity. Okay, so I, I will not dismiss with dignity, uh, Buana Chair, but uh, from, from us to uh, the panelists, we are extremely grateful for putting up time to uh, to, to, to share your knowledge on this uh, topic of emerging trends in insolvency law. I would like to say it's been quite a captivating session and personally I've learned quite a lot from the different uh, emerging trends that are happening uh, from the partner states and um, from the proposals that are given by the speakers with regards to, uh, with regards to having amendments to laws the discussions on corporate rescue and cross-border insolvency. Uh, we've taken that up as secretariat and uh, dear participants be on the lookout for more of our capacity building sessions on insolvency law. We're going to continue these discussions even on the group. If you'd like to join the insolvency law committee, kindly reach out to us at info at elawsociety.org, express your interest and uh, we'll have this forwarded to the committee for uh, for the verification. And before I end this, I would like to also inform you that from the 22nd to the 25th of November 2023, we'll be having the biggest gathering of lawyers in East and Central Africa, which is going to be hosted by the East Africa Law Society uh, during its uh, annual conference in Bujumbura. So uh, I look forward to seeing most of you there. Uh, we're going to have uh, amazing discussions in Bujumbura and uh, we're being hosted by Clava. So uh, come join. Uh, we could also host a session during the annual law conference. And uh, and yeah, so you can get more information on, uh, on the annual law conference at our uh, email info at elosociety.org or check onto our website. Uh, the conference fees are available and we have discounted rates for early birds. So um, looking forward to seeing you all in Bujumbura and uh, uh, in the subsequent months, be on the lookout for our, our, our trainings. We have uh, construction law and feeding contracts training in Mombasa. It's happening on the 20 
28th and the 29th, rather the 27th and 28th of, uh, of September 2023, kindly uh, reach out to us for more information. But otherwise, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, we'll be issuing out a recording of this training session. We'll also issue you with uh, certificates of participation, which will be sent to your email addresses that you use to register for the session. So to our panelists, uh, Mr. Isaac, uh, Clever, Tabisa, Yves, Frederick, uh, Victoria, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to hosting you again. and. Uh, have yourselves a very lovely day. So with those few words, allow me to close the session and have a lovely evening. Thank you.